Hello, my name is David Ades. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry reading series and now podcast series called Poets Corner in association with West Words in Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. So each month, uh, I have a guest poet on this program uh, who will read and talk about poems for an hour or so of their choice um, on a theme of their choice. Our guest poet today is Ali Cobby Eckerman, who will read poems and talk on the life experience of being a stolen generations person. And normally, uh, I start off with an acknowledgement of country and then introduce the poet. But today I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to introduce Ali first and then Ali will do the acknowledgement. Ali Cobby Eckerman's first collection, Little Bit Long Time, was written in the desert and launched her literary career in 2009. In 2013, Ali toured Ireland as Australia's poetry ambassador and won the Kenneth Slessor Prize for Poetry and Book of the Year for Ruby Moonlight, a massacre verse novel. In 2014, Ali was the inaugural recipient of the Tungununka Pinchanti Fellowship at Adelaide Writers Week and the first Aboriginal Australian writer to attend the International Writing Program at University of Iowa. In 2017, Ali received a Wyndham Campbell Award for Poetry from Yale University and she was awarded a Literature Fellowship by the Australian Council for the Arts in 2018. Ali was granted a Civitella Ranieri Fellowship in Italy in 2019, and she is currently an adjunct professor at RMIT in Melbourne. Hi, Ali, and welcome to Poets Corner. Um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to hand over to you to do the acknowledgement of the Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a cultural protocol to acknowledge that I'm on Nadjeri country. It's the beautiful land where I live. Pay respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd like to pay respects to all Aboriginal people and Islander people across the many nations that make up Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community. Thanks, Ali. Um, I'd like to um, start off with a couple of questions, lead-in questions, before we get to the poems. Um, now, I know that this podcast is likely to be viewed by people outside of Australia who may not be aware of or fully understand the meaning of stolen generations. So I thought we'd start off um, by my asking you to explain a little bit to me, to us, about what, what your reference to being a Stolen Generations person actually means to you. When I was little, I had no idea of, um, of what that meant. And, um, you know, I knew that I was adopted and I knew that my um, birth family was Aboriginal, but there was no way as a child that I could actually quite put the two of them together. I was very fortunate to have an adopted Aboriginal brother. And um, so we knew that it was a little strange growing up on the farm and going to school and, um, and then we had an adopted um, younger cousin and she was also Aboriginal. And so we sort of thought that was peculiar, but we couldn't put it together in our imagination. And believe me, I had a big imagination as a child. I was a very curious kid. So it was quite later in life when um, I think it was 84, around, um, and they, the Royal Commission into all these thousands of people like myself who were looking for our families. And at that 
um, uh, Royal Commission, the report was called the Bringing Them Home. And from there, uh, when I learnt the term stolen generations. And it's generations with an S. Because for the 250 years that Australia has been colonised by the British, it's quite the practice to remove children from Aboriginal families and saying that, you know, it's always this like missionary approach. We are giving you a better life. The um, assimilation life will be your saving grace, generation after generation after generation, especially when it became a little unfashionable to just go out in the paddocks and shoot us. My mother didn't grow up with her mother. I didn't grow up with my mother. My son didn't grow up with me. You know, some days I can say that without being tearful. Obviously, today is not one of those days. I don't know why. It's a peculiar legacy. And I've been fortunate to have so much healing amongst my community and amongst both of my families in Australia. But I've also been um, very blessed to have healing overseas and to sit with other cultured people who are actually horrified at the continuance of this family genocide, for, for a term, cultural gen genocide that continues in this country even today. I remember when I was in um, Medellin in um, Colombia at the uh, Poetry and Shamans uh, gathering, such a powerful place to be. Oh. Um, and I met with three women from South America and they were quite confused about why my poetry was so sad everything was being interpreted. There was people from all around the world. And we met one evening as women with the interpreters and it took nearly an hour for them to really grasp the concept of stolen generations. And they were horrified as grandmothers, as women, that this, this continues. For them, they described to me that... It's such a horror because it's the breaking of grandmother's law and in all their cultures across South America and ours. Grandmother's law is one of the most precious and shouldn't be ruined. I remember crying when they said even war doesn't do this. What happens to... The, the Aboriginal Australians and this constant cruel behaviour by the ruling governments is beyond war. This constant ripping a heart of the a heart of the heart of the soul of the conscious, upsetting the emotional equilibrium, generation after generation after generation. And I know it's continuing member of my family works in the children's hospital, rarely talks about work. But after reading one of the, the, the final poem that I'll read today, he came and sat quietly and he said, they are stealing a lot of babies from the hospital. You know, I see his strength and his love for his people of wanting to work in health and be in those places, but I see what it's doing to his health. It's such a, you know, it's such a healthy thing. And then you meet other stolen generation people who were so resilient and kind. We were always looking out for each other. We were always reading faces. We understand the pain of others that who can't break free from that. And I must admit in the last 12 months, I've realised that despite all your efforts, despite everything that you would try to do for a better life, 
you can never escape the pain of being a stolen generation survivor. Uh, I mean, uh, generations and generations going through the same experience. Um, how does this, how, I mean, obviously it informs all of your poetry. Um, is your poetry uh, a mechanism for you to speak truth to power, um, to try and get yourself understood, to try and understand yourself, all of those things? Yeah, and my poetry is a celebration. Um, and my poetry is... Um, a testament that I finally found my my skill, I suppose, my DNA skill. You know, I always wanted to be a writer when I was a little girl, but of course, uh, school wasn't very encouraging. Probably I was a really little honest pain in the butt at school. Um, it probably got me in a little a lot of trouble. I remember being in trouble quite a lot, um, and. It's my way of helping others like myself who might be um, struggling emotionally. Um, I think when we're young, our resilience is um, probably uh, in the masking of our sorrows. We will internalise so much. So reading being a private thing that people wanted to get my work published um, for the sake of others. So they might be reading something in my poetry that might just help them get through that hour or that day or that week. Because when you read something and you can place yourself into that story, um, there's something about, you know, they say a story shared is um is a you know a, a good place in 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 the journey it can lessen the the impact of things and i remember that when i first read um sally morgan's um book back in the 70s and um you know there's sometimes it was my life on the page and i was astounded um because i i guess that's the first moment that I knew my uh, that other people were holding the same secrets but mm -hmm. Sally Morgan was publishing her family story and um, that intrigued me at the time of course I, I, I couldn't act on that for, for many years um, it's very unsettling to not know who you are mm -hmm. I'm very grateful very blessed that I grew up in a kind adopted family that we grew up um, on a farm, that I grew up on country. Mm. Um, again, it was Nadjeri country. Um, I'll keep returning to this beautiful um, part of Australia in the mid-north of South Australia. Oh, I've just lost. I'm just uh, lost in the beauty of this country and that, um, that I keep coming coming back here it is quite a solace to me i'm very grateful to have found a place not my own language group but uh, a country that um that i can um borrow and um and and rest my sadness mm. can i ask you um ali how did you find your your voice in poetry mm. Well, as I mentioned, I always wanted to be a um, little writer and um, I've got three poems that I found from the Brinkworth Area School magazine. I think they were written in grade one and grade three. Um, the little psychologist in me just goes, they're not very good, oh, they're very deep, um, what the hell is going on? Um, they're quite innocent, I think, but I, but I know there's a depth in there. Um, so anyway, um, schooling wasn't um, always a positive thing for me, but I could read. And we always had books in the house. It's very important to have books in the house. Mm. If you don't read yourself, just buy books for your kids or your visitors or, um, you know, whoever. 
Um, and so I read nearly every book in the in the house. I was always fascinated with story. Um, Reader's Digest had drama in real life. Oh, I was fascinated um, with people who had survived bear attacks and um, all these other physical disasters. And there was something in that that resonated with me. I was really hungry for those stories. But I think in there they were sharing a little bit of the emotional, um, like overcoming of the fear, and they were talking about healing. Um, but it was always in the physical sense. Um, and eventually I um, signed up. It was after meeting mum. Oh, no, just before meeting mum, actually. I went to rehab. Um, I had uh, had a long association with uh, drugs and alcohol and I went to rehab. Oh, what a wonderful place. Boy, did I need a rest. I realised it really wasn't about the drugs and alcohol after all. Um, I was absolutely exhausted emotionally, physically, spiritually. And to have a safe environment with a fairly gentle routine, and some of it was a bit crap but nothing compared to what I'd um, gone through, lived my lived experience, and we had to write a journal. And... Um, I guess that was the start of that cathartic writing, you know, and mucking around a little bit and some of it was just day to day. And um, then I met my mum and um, and then a few years later I was back in Alice Springs, I love the desert, and there was the creative writing course at Bachelor College and I signed up for that and that's really was the starting point of... Um, another safe environment, an Aboriginal TAFE college, um, Aboriginal lecturers, Aboriginal students, Aboriginal gardeners, Aboriginal cooks, um, to start exploring internally uh, all this stuff that was yet to reveal. Thank goodness for... Um, uh, having access to Aboriginal community because in tragedy there's a great humour and um, I learnt to, that, um, that, that I had a humour without the use of drugs and alcohol. I'd needed that before, I didn't need it now. And um, once I think you start the cathartic writing or any art practice or um, skill, um, I think it's very hard to stop. Mm. Shall we have mm. a poem? Yes, this is um, this is my one of the first poems that I wrote, um, and um, and I have um, permission to this from the family in Alice Springs. I tell you true, I can't stop drinking. I tell you true, since I watched my daughter perish, she burnt to death inside a car. I lost what I most cherish. I saw the angels hold her as I screamed with useless hope. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true. It's the only way I cope. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true. Since I found my sister dead, she hung herself to stop the rapes. I found her in the shed. That rapist bastard still lives here, unpunished in this town. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true since I cut her down. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true, since my mother passed away. They found her battered down the creek. I miss her more each day. My family blame me for her death. Their words have made me wild. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true, cause I was just a child. So if you see someone like me, who's drunk and loud and cursing, don't judge too hard. Because you don't know what sorrows we are nursing. Yeah. It's, it's very it's very hard. I found it very hard as a teenager having, you know, I could be try to be tough on the outside, but inside being so vulnerable um, and being so easily influenced by drugs and alcohol to um to fill that void, um, more masking of emotion. Um, and also, you know, 
um, trying to find a place to belong. I think it's really important to not be too harsh in our criticisms. Um, and, and not to be too harsh on yourself too. Mm, mm. I mean, there is a tendency, isn't there, for people to be prone to judgment, but nobody has lived anybody else's lived experience. So it's, it, it's an easy way out rather than trying to see who it actually is who's standing before you. Yeah, but we need to say it often because, um, you know, we still see that harshness, that, that judgmentalism or the excuses, um, you know, like um, abusers, are very, some abusers are very quick to become the victims. Hang mm. on, like, you know, can you see yourself? Yeah. Yeah. What responses have you had um, from people to this poem? Um, quite good. Um, I wanted to um, it not to focus on the tragedy of um, those experiences, the, the stories shared me by a beautiful family. But um, I wanted uh, non-Indigenous people to um, know beyond what the what they might be witnessing, mm. that there is something much deeper, and um, and part of that, um, especially in areas where um, uh, there's a lot of Ab Aboriginal um, population, to know that behind that first glance is still a deeply cultured people who are still grieving the colonisation of their land. Yeah, it doesn't stop, does it? No. The grief doesn't stop. The loss doesn't stop, keenly felt. But how, and you can't undo the damage, <laughs> but you can stop perpetrating the damage, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, you can't go, you can't go back. You can't go back to change the damage. So I've learnt in my own um, life and, 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 and choices of being um, to look forward more. You can make more change forward because you can't, it's impossible to change what's happened. So, you know, angry words, can, you, you know, we might regret that. But um, they can only be healed in the future by having another conversation or, you know, a meaningful apology or, um, you know, kind deeds. Kind mm. deeds don't sit behind us. Kind deeds sit in the moment and, and, and just in front of us. Mm. Um, another really important poem that I wrote um, in the creative workshop at um, Bachelor College was this one, this was when I was starting to, poetry was starting to allow me to see more clearly um, what had been happening in my upbringing and to where I had arrived um, at um, Bachelor after meeting my son, uh, finding my son and meeting my mother. Circles and squares. I was born Yankunjara. My mother is Yankunjara. Her mother is Yankunjara. My family is Yankunjara. I have learned many things from my family elders. I have grown to recognize that my life travels in circles. My Aboriginal culture has taught me that universal life is circular. When I was born, I was not allowed to live with my family. I grew up in the white man's world. We lived in a square house. We picked fruit and vegetables from a neatly fenced square plot. We kept animals in square paddocks. We sat and ate at a square table. We sat on square chairs. I slept in a square mirror. I slept on a, in a square bed. I looked at myself in a square mirror and did not know who I was. One day I met my mother. I just knew that this meeting was part of our healing circle. Then I began to travel. 
I visited places that I had been before, but this time I sat down with family. We gathered closely together by big round campfires. We ate bush tucker feasting on round ants and berries. We ate meat from animals that live in round burrows. We slept in circles on our beach around our fires. We sat in the dirt on our land that belongs to a big round planet. We watched the moon grow to a magnificent yellow circle. That was our time. I have learned two different ways now. I am thankful for this. This is part of my life circle. My heart is round like a drum, ready to echo the music of my family. But the square within me remains. The square stops me in my entirety. So you open this poem with a declaration of identity. I am Yungunjara, emphatic. This is who I am. And yet, having been, been removed from that identity at a young age and having inhabited another identity before returning to that identity, if you like, you, you, you straddled two worlds across your life. And you, you say in the poem that you're thankful for both. But um, they're, they're not easily reconcilable, are they? And they, they sit side by side. And they, are they separate within you? How, how do you navigate those two worlds? As I mentioned, I'm very grateful. I grew up in a kind family and um, fairly humble farmers in the mid-north when I was growing up. Um, you know, they're not like the super farms now. It was very neighbourly. Um, Dad had um, two brothers nearby, so there was lots of sharing and caring um, that we saw, um, that we experienced. Um, there was lots of sharing of food. Um, and... My families have, through the Lutheran Church, had a connection and um, some had known each other like before I was born. And as I was piecing the two stories together, everyone was um, in agreement to go back and investigate those stories. I remember my uncle from the West Coast um, had come and stayed with me in Adelaide after a significant family funeral. And on the way back, we drove through um, Blythe and Brinkworth where I'd grown up. And um, he used to work there when he was a teenager and he um, played football with my godfather. Yeah. And so that was the first time there was a Cobby and an Eckerman in the, in the team photo. Hmm. And um, anyway, he um, and I live at Kalunga. He had um, played a grand final at Kalunga and they were vicious matches, you know, they were very territorial back in those days. Um, and he had, I think, kicked the winning goal or got the best and fairest. Um, the men said he played like Andrew McLeod. He was a very good footballer. And when he got back to Blythe because he was Aboriginal, he wasn't allowed to... Um, have a beer inside the hotel, even though he was sort of like the hero of the day. Mm. And they'd meet, beaten those bastards from over there, you know. And um, and so other people that I met, some of my friends from school, um, their dads um, bought a couple of flagons and went with him and sat out in the scrub and they chose to um, sit with my uncle and um, have those celebra celebratory drinks. So 40 years later... I got to take him into the Blythe Hotel um, where I had worked once when I discovered I was pregnant and was shamed by the community um, and buy him his first schooner of beer in, in that pub. And um, around the corner was that photo um, with the Cobby and the Eckerman together and the young guys down the end of the bar, they, after a while they asked us, they said, who are you guys? And um, we told them and they were the ones that went and got that photo because he was a um, local hero in the footy club. 
So then after a few drinks, I said, come on, let's go down and see Uncle Ray, my godfather. And we opened the door and um, it was a surprise. And I watched both of those men cry because they were good mates. And Australia's a bit of a dirt bag that they couldn't remain mates. They had to go their separate ways, you know, to look after their families and whatever. And that all this, these social norms kept them apart. And they really, you know, admired and perhaps loved each other as men do. This, um, you know, my, my godfather was a remarkable man. And um, we sat inside and we had a, you know, I listened to these men talk for about an hour and um, could see that aberration. And then um, uncle used to work for another um, um, man that I called um, Uncle Roy Hinchke. And um, so then we went there and knocked on his door and he too cried. And, and that family still had little kangaroo figurines that uncle had carved when he was 17. And I think it was probably that night that, um, you know, I knew that reconciliation could exist. I knew these two families could be side by side and that I didn't have to choose, mm. that there was a strength about um, 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 bringing both sides of my family together because there was a beautiful past. And I think if you look deep, deep enough, you know, you can sort of find it, maybe not in your immediate family, but definitely maybe in a township um, story or something. Australia always leaves out the stories of Aboriginal friendship, Aboriginal heroism in a, in a, in a township society. Mm. They just like to tell those other stories and it's a, it, it's a, it's a real detriment um, to us and a real shame of Australia. Anyway, we had a far too many drinks that night. Me and Uncle had to sleep in the car <laughs> down some back road. And, you know, we laughed up and then we laughed in the morning because it was just so ridiculous. And he was saying, you know, Ali, life's ridiculous. You've got to keep laughing. Just go with the flow, you know. Must Bless have been, him. must have been very powerful to connect those two strands of your life. Yeah, 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 yeah. You want to read yeah, we drove all along, you know, and then I went and got more people, um, the older people from Adelaide and drove them those back roads back to Sejuna and listened to all their stories. Mm. You know, when Jimmy Sharman's boxing troop was at the Clare Showground and my auntie saw my uncle was one of the boxers and, you know, they got married and had five children and, you know, there was just stories everywhere. I've been really blessed. You know, those early journeys definitely um, were moulding my poetry before I, you know, was writing poetry. Yeah. I was the passenger, but I was the driver. Do you want to give us another poem, Ali? And then suddenly all those old people are gone. Yeah. You know, it's only 34 when I met my mum. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And I hated everyone that told me I should be grateful when she passed. But one by one, all those beautiful people, those older people that welcomed me back were, um, were going as they have to. Everyone um, comes to that part in their life. And, you know, that made me feel so strong. And in the passing of them, a vulnerability returned and I hadn't been quite prepared for that. Mm. As Uncle said, just go for it. So I, you know, I lived my happiest years um, in probably that decade. Mm. This is my last, last love poem to um, my mother, Mum Audrey. It's the title of my latest collection. It's a few years old now. It's called Inside My Mother. My mother screams as I touch her hair, attempting to brush away the coarseness with my hands, to entwine twigs filled with leaves into her locks, a tiara of green to soften her face. And our tears dry now, my mother is frailing. 
She talks only to those who have gone before, no longer seeing my love, no longer needing. And the wailing bursts from her mouths as she sinks to the ground, her mother, the earth, my mother, the dying. Throws sand in her face, tasting the grit in her mouth and wailing louder, throws herself forward, pushing her breasts into the softness of the earth, her mother, and my mother, the dying, crawls down into that final embrace, her conversation incoherent now, as if like a child she is practising words for the lifetime to come. And the syllables loud and guttural spill over the sand, her mother, the earth, and I walk away leaving her there in that cradle, safely nestled in the roots of that tree, safe in our country, our solace, her grave. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, being a Stolen Generations person, you experienced um, a rupturing of everything, really, at a very young age a rupturing of relationships, of family, of identity, of culture, of country, and none more so than the rupturing of your relationship with your mother. Um, I can't imagine what that must be like. Um, when you write a poem like this and you, you say it's a love poem, and I see that, um, and you're referring to her connection with her ancestors, and her mother earth is it a way of reinserting you into that sort of linear narrative of, of the, the continuity of the culture and the relationships um i think i've uh, realized that i'm not reinserting i've always been in my family and um i've came to that because my family was always grieving me. It was a story that I found later in life. And I was shocked that my family was grieving me because I've always been told I was unwanted and, um, and that they wouldn't care and they would, you know, be a hopeless bunch anyway. And, um, and then I realised that my adopted parents had been told that. And they were quite celebrating that that wasn't true either. And um, so I wasn't reinserting. I had, I had always been in my family, but they had been grieving. And my auntie, who um, I'd been promised to, my mother's um, cousin, um, was going to grow me up with her children. And for many, many, many years... Um, on my birthday, the, um, she would gather her children and pray for this missing girl. And her children, it, ha it went on for so many years that her children thought, oh, maybe mum got it wrong. And I remember the looks on their faces, um, thinking, God, this is a smiling family. Um, when I walked through the door after 35 years and, and it took some while for them to tell me that, um, you know, we thought mum had got it wrong and all of a sudden there you are and that explained these huge smiles on their faces. Um, it was quite, again, it was quite shocking to, to learn that truth and know that there had been so many lies, not only to me, but, um, you know, to my adopted parents as well. So what was the other part of that question again, um, David? I can't remember. <laughs> but I can ask you another one. Um, <laughs> the references in the poem to her mother, the earth, um, mm. point me to that very special relationship that Indigenous Australians have with country. I just wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your relationship with country. Oh... Well, I've always loved country and I'm reminded every time I come back to live in the mid-north on Nadjeri country how much I love this sky. I think the Nadjeri country is blessed with one of the best skies I've seen. Or maybe it's because I know it and I've, I've lived under it the most. 
But also in that poem, you know, my mother died in Canberra. She was quite the advocate um, for um, reconciliation. Um, and um, it was very important for us to bring her home and um, we did. And thanks to her husband, Derek, who drove her ashes in the passenger car all the way from Canberra over to um, Sejuna and um, we buried her with uncle um, at Conaba Mission at the cemetery out there. Um, because um, if we are removed by other hands at our birth, wherever possible, I think we want to own where we lie in our death. We owe that to ourselves and our families. And the land knows, you silly buggers, this is powerful land and we belong to it and it loves us and the land knows everything you're doing. Um, you used the words in the last couple of lines, um, safely and safe, twice. Um, does that come from a feeling that life is inherently unsafe as a result of your experiences of it? I think mine has been. And, um, and I was feeling pretty unsafe in this in this body and making, you know, wrong decisions, which now I have to just trust was part of my life journey. How I wish I could turn around the adoption of my own son. I have to look to the future to repair that and um, you make bad decisions when you feel unsafe. Everyone has this intrinsic need to belong. And when your original belonging place is taken from you, and the, the first, you know, the first thing you know is removal. It's a very unsafe place. I know now that I've had um, time enough with my family to trust. If I have a feeling of unsafety, I trust that I'm not safe. I don't question it anymore. Um, but when I didn't have the balance of knowing, it was a very um, complicated and sometimes dangerous living. Do you want to read another poem for us, Ellie? And then when the the elders are gone, when all the when all the oldies that held you together are gone, then suddenly you're thrust into maternity and being of the, the oldest of your family line. It's such a strange place to be. I feel like I'd only just arrived. <laughs> Another damage of, of removal that I should have felt confident, the whole family should have moved with me into this role. We should have all moved into our new roles at the passing of our elders. And here we are just arriving and, um, and we've, we've, you know, we've lost something really precious. The thing that I noticed the most at that um, early role of um, matriarchy was it was a really, really big mirror and it was no more clouded, you know. It was a very clear mirror and the reality of life was very stark. This was the time when a lot of depression and anxiety it was almost it was post-traumatic stress uh, I was just you know it was very challenging it was very challenging and um, because of the vulnerability of that place I wasn't probably you know I, I didn't have the the trust trusted elders to share with anymore became quite 
mm, isolated. And you, you still, you grab for all the gratitudes. I had, you know, I had grandchildren being born and I had a writing career that had come out of jolly nowhere and was giving me um, amazing opportunities. But it still wasn't enough. I still had to unpack everything to find out why I was back feeling so vulnerable. The joy of renewal. There is no greater joy than to hold your only son for the first time at the airport. He is 18 now when he returns to me and I am the prodigal mother restored. Now he has two boys and every time we play, my grandsons teach me exactly what was lost. Well, there's enormous pain um, underlying this poem as there is in many of your poems, um, as is clear from the references to being restored as a mother and to what was lost. But here um, you have chosen to focus on not just acknowledging the pain, but transcending it to the joy. So in this, in this poem, I sense a, move, a movement um, towards healing and towards grace, if you like. And I just wanted to ask you how important healing and grace are, not just in your work, but in your life. I'm a young and dada woman. Young and dada are healers. The old people in the desert taught me that. I lived out there for 10 years. That is unchangeable. Tears are good. I never cried for 27 years. Now it's a blessing to be able to shed tears whenever I need to. I think that time with my grandsons was a very beautiful time, even though afterwards I would have to go and cry at the realisation, you know. I never got to wash my son, bathe my son. I never got to bottle feed him. I never got to play on the floor. I never got to teach him about the fire and the wind. But as young and younger people, as of all the Aboriginal tribes in us that make up Australia, we are powerful. We're the oldest continuum in the world. There is wisdom among us that is so profound. We care deeply for each other. Even at times if we can't show that, we know that instinctively that we care for each other. And we have, despite everything, we have the purpose to try to do our best ability. And you can't do better than your best, so don't judge any of us for our children and our grandchildren to just know how much we love them as we have been loved for a millennia of generations, the millennia of generations that wasn't stolen from each other. Thanks, Sally. You have one more poem for us today. And we have to remain vigilant all the time because the Australian government is full of tricks and some of our people get tricked in their high paying jobs. As I said, when I met my mother, she was the first co-chair of National Sorry Day. She worked very hard for reconciliation along with so many beautiful elders who were also passed. They were in Canberra and other capital cities working very hard. We all remember the day that a quarter of a million people walked across Sydney Harbour Bridge. I'd known my mum for such a short time then. I remember the first National Sorry Day. I was a student at Townley College and they had a big celebration there. 
Heather Shearer was there who helped me find my mum. My brother Chris was there, my adopted brother. Well up dearly. And many Aboriginal friends. I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying was because I'd made it home. And I think I was crying and hoping that so many others had the opportunity to make it home. Recently, I went to the Apology Day breakfast. There was another moving day. I was out in the desert. I didn't go to Canberra. I was traveling to Perth the next day with a, uh, an artist who um, was um, elderly and, um, and she was having her first solo exhibition. So I thought it was worth staying home and jumping on the plane and um, taking her to see the ocean for the first time. I thought that would be great fun and it was. And she never saw a boat. Um, gosh, we had fun. But the apology got to be, um, was a powerful day. Um, half the community came up to my place and held my hand and we watched it together. At the apology day breakfast in Adelaide in February last month, we suddenly realised that one of the sponsors for the Apology Day Breakfast was the Department of Child Prevention. I call it the Department of Child Removal. And it was horrifying to know that the very department who removes the children can sponsor an event that was about the apology of removing the children. This is the complication of Australia. It's almost insanity. I wrote this poem and I'm gonna be protesting next year for my mum and all those other elders who were crying for truth and justice back in their time. This poem's called in response to the 14th Apology Day breakfast, just the fact that it's the, uh, the 14th Apology will say something else about the insanity of this country. How dare you celebrate my survival using fancy words as puffs of air to smoke screen the damage of my removal, the loss of being in my rightful place, removed from my mother's sweat wet chest, taken away from her blessing touch. I know my mother cried out loudly for me as robbers stole my first glimpse in the world from the love she held in her eyes for me. Did anyone listen or soothe my cry, that endless yearn that can't be satisfied? Was I punished as I mourned for her? Adoption at Kate Cox Baby Home was your answer. Cold steel cribs to hold babies that were not held. The strict order to prevent attachment by staff. A precise design frame held the bottle to feed us. Two children in each cot to suckle rejection. Rotated each end to strengthen our necks. Random women volunteer to reduce removal shock, to bottle feed anonymous on their laps. No one knows the baby's real names. Do you celebrate my first emotion was grief? Don't acknowledge the newborn baby now. She's far too beautiful for you to hold. Thanks, Ali. Um, uh, like, like a lot of Australians, I thought that the apology when it finally came was a long time coming, was a powerful moment and perhaps, you know, a, a turning point, but maybe not so much a turning point. To move forward, how do we move forward now, you know, with sincerity to make that apology meaningful on an, on an ongoing basis. If the Apology Day breakfast is kind of like 
paying lip service to it and not going further than that? How do we move forward, do you think? Oh, I feel the older I'm getting, the more I'm running out of answers. Um, I think for me, it's to keep educating myself, to keep trying to be the best version I can, to apologize more for the mistakes I've made along the past. I need to own some things and to work within a smaller community to create the safety net that we all need so we can blossom. I believe in ripple effects. I believe all the little ripple effects can, can join up one day. I don't know. I just believe that. Um, I think we're seeing how confused and erratic our governments are, and each one seems to be more peculiar. We trust in the resilience of the people. We trust in our right to march. We do not allow the governments to make art diminish by cutting funding. We will find ways to just keep being strong in all artistic expressions. For me, I'm blessed that I have an association with a powerful country that I can go and sit with the old trees that knew me as I rode past on my push bike when I was a little girl and to swim in water holes that knew me when I was a very unhappy teenager. And sometimes that's the only solace you can find. But more and more standing and talking my truth, people come back into my lives. At Adelaide Writers Week this year, the teacher that taught me to read, she was there, her daughter was in my class and I recognised them. And she had slides of um, Trudy's 11th birthday, I think. I've never seen these photos of myself. They arrived yesterday in the mail. I didn't even know I could smile or laugh at that age, but I obviously could because now I have that image. It's a small gesture. It's a powerful gesture for me to keep pushing that wounded child to putting her to bed. I want to be the best grandma that I can. I want to make up to my son for not being able to keep him, not being strong enough. I want us to move forward as healthy as we can as a family. And I want to find the joy that I had in life when the elders were alive. I don't know. Just blessings to everyone. We're doing a fabulous job. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you for your poetry and for your truths and for your insights and for sharing the very personal and very deeply experienced subject of being a Stolen Generations person with us. Thank you so much. When this video is posted, it will include information on how to obtain copies of Ali's books. So look out for that. Please check in again at the end of April when Poets Corner will feature the Queensland poet Damon O'Brien on the theme of the end of things, which seems particularly apt as Sydney is surrounded by floodwaters at the moment. We'll see you then.